W.B. Smith speaking. I have been moved a number of times as to what happened to Project Magnet. So I prepared the following statement, which I would like to read. Project Magnet was authorized in December 1950 following a request made to the Canadian Department of Transport by myself for permission to make use of the department's laboratory and field facilities in a study of unidentified flying objects and physical principles which might appear to be involved. The program consisted of two parts. The first part was the collecting of as much high-quality data as possible, analyzing it, and, where possible, drawing conclusions from it. The second part consisted of a systematic questioning of all our basic concepts in the hopes of turning up a discrepancy which might prove to be the key to a new technology. Unfortunately, the program was plagued by well-meaning but misguided journalists who were looking for spectacular copy or copy which could be turned to political account to such an extent that both those who were working on the project and the Department of Transport found themselves in an embarrassed position. Consequently, when the Project Magnet report was made and permission sought to extend the scope of the investigation through federal financial support, the decision was finally made in 1954 that this would not be advisable in the face of the publicity from which the whole project had suffered. Project Magnet was officially dropped by the Department of Transport in October 1954. Although the department indicated its willingness to permit the continued use of laboratory facilities, provided this could be done at no cost to the public treasury, the project has been continuing under these conditions, and to this extent may be said to have gone underground. The government of Canada are not participants in the project and not in any way responsible for its conclusions. The conclusions reached by Project Magnet and contained in the official report were based on a rigid statistical analysis of sighting reports and were as follows. There is a 91% probability that at least some of the sightings are of real objects of unknown origin. There is about 60% probability that these objects are alien vehicles, that is, alien meaning not of earthly fabrication. The conclusions based on studies of the basic physical concepts were as follows. Many of our fundamental concepts are inherently ambiguous, and quite a different philosophy can be built up on the alternatives. Several of these alternatives lead to much simpler arithmetic and presentations which do not have to resort to patchwork corrections to make them all embracing. Furthermore, some of our ideas with respect to fields and their behavior are wrong. Recent Project Magnet activities have dealt with following up any and all leads. Many of these leads were dead ends, but a few were quite significant and well worth the overall effort. At the present time, a definite pattern is emerging, and the groundwork is being laid for a new technology which may literally lead us to the stars. And I have signed this report and have offered it to a number of publications who wish to clarify the status of Project Magnet. One of the results of the publicity which Project Magnet received was that I received a large number of communications from people all over the world. Of course, quite a number of these communications were definitely of the crank or crackpot class, but I did take the time and trouble to follow up every one which looked the least bit promising. And as a result, I did establish a number of connections which I found most profitable. Quite a number of people, a surprising number in fact, claim to have made contact with the space people in one way or another. In following up the leads, I tried not 
to let these people know of the existence of any other group which had made contact. But I tried to act as a clearinghouse for the information which was funneled in to me. By asking judicious questions of each of the various groups, I was able to obtain information which I could cross-check against similar information obtained through other sources. As a matter of fact, there are approximately a half dozen groups which have made contact with the space people, which I feel are authentic. I've asked these people to answer certain questions concerning the life, philosophy, and science of the races which inhabit space and which live on the other planets and travel from one planet to another. I found that practically all, without exception, of the answers have been consistent. These people tell exactly the same story in almost the same words. In some instances, the, even the words are identical, even though the manner in which they reach me is totally different in the various cases. The early history of the human race has been given to me on three separate occasions through three separate contacts and in each case has been to all intents and purposes as nearly identical as our own history books ever record any historical fact. I feel myself that these are histories are authentic. Naturally, I've asked quite a number of questions concerning the basic science the mathematics and the physics and chemistry which these people use. And I've come to the conclusion that it is quite different from what we call our science. Their ideas of matter, atoms, and so on is quite a bit different than ours. And I must say, when understood, it is ever so much simpler than ours. We have built a mathematical monstrosity out of the universe, and we are insisting that all of our experimental data be squeezed and coerced to fit this mathematical mon monstrosity. The basic science that I have been able to obtain from the space people is beautifully simple. There, as a matter of fact, it is so simple that I'm really surprised that we have passed it by and never discovered it on our own. My contacts with the space people have only extended over the last two years. And naturally, in two years, and with very sporadic contacts, not very much ground could be covered. Consequently, so far as the space people science is concerned, I feel that I am very definitely in the kindergarten. However, I do feel that I have sufficient fundamentals so that, given the time and the opportunity to do so, I could proceed at least as far in their science as I have proceeded in our own science in taking my basic engineering degrees. These are the matter conditions which exist. First, in the aggregates of matter, the spin vector K S seems to be oriented in random directions. And second, the spins in the electrical fabric seem to be oriented all in the same direction. Hence, N F has a fixed direction for us. This means that unless some special effort is made to line up spins in the physical fabric, their net vectorial sum will be about zero. But in the electrical fabric, they are already lined up, and our time scale is a direct result of the sum of the spin vectors present. It might well at this point to consider the units of the various fabrics. In the physical fabric, it is, of course, obvious that we can have position and direction only. Any action? The difficulty, of course, is in the question of materials. They can describe to me materials which have certain characteristics, but I have usually a pretty hard time finding such materials among those which we might have available. 
because the materials having the characteristics which they describe as suitable for one job are used by us for a totally different purpose and sometimes the very characteristics which the space people say are desirable are the characteristics that we consider less desirable and in the production of the material we do our best to suppress these characteristics. I would like to cite one example of this. In questioning the methods of communication used in the case of one contact, I concluded that the actual transmission was by means of a wave somewhat resembling a radio wave, but having all three field components closed on themselves so that the wave itself would have no external effect, would be, in effect, an entity in itself, very much like a photon. They informed me that this concept was correct. I asked if I could make these waves, and they said yes, I could do so with a comparatively simple device. Uh, I asked them how this device was made, and they described it to me. As a matter of fact, they showed me some mental pictures of how it was done. Needless to say, at the first opportunity, I hurried around and obtained some pieces of ferrite material, uh, cores of ferrite, and wound on them a coil with the particular configuration that they described. In fact, I wound up two coils so that I could have the pair to play with. In operating in the lab, I found that these coils developed most peculiar properties that the radiations from the transmitting coil would lock onto the receiving coil, and it didn't matter then where the receiving coil was taken, the radiations always followed it and did not diminish in intensity as you would expect of a radio wave. However, the radio wave, or these little waves that we were playing with, did not always lock onto the receiving coil which caused us a great deal of concern. Further inquiry, however, uh, gave us the information that the waves were mentally controllable and that it was a case of mental manipulation on our part, that is, on the experimenter's part, as to whether these waves would lock between transmitter and receiver or whether they would not. A particular friend of mine here who has the misfortune to be blind uh, has displayed quite a number of unique mental capabilities. So I turned one of these coils over to him to see what he could do with it. He very soon found that by using it on his radio transmitter and by certain mental manipulations, he was able to make the radio wave come down just about where he wanted it. As a matter of fact, in operating on the amateur band, he was able to move the uh, reception point from one amateur in a distant city to another amateur less than a mile away, much to the amazement of the two amateurs at the receiving end, who uh, figured that uh, George had a most marvelous type of antenna. I ask and obtain clearance uh, from the space people to permit the publication of information on this particular coil. And uh, I asked uh, George if he would prepare the necessary document, which he did, and sent it in to uh, one of the amateur periodicals for publication. However, the amateur periodical wished to uh, test the coil before they published the article. Whereupon, they, were, they found that they were completely unable to obtain the core material in the size and dimensions which were necessary in order to make the coil work. Trying other sizes and other types of ferrite, the coil was used to operate. I then tried with some other samples of ferrite which I had. I tried winding the coil on the other coils and I found that I couldn't make it work either. Apparently, the combination is very critical. We did find out, however, that a smaller core operated with a different winding pitch, 
and with higher power would function quite as well as the original coil. And we're now working out to find out what the limiting conditions are, both insofar as the ferrite material is concerned and the details of the winding. David Middleton, uh, he is one of the directors of the ARRL, has the other coil, the mate to the one which George Lafleur has at the present time. And so far as I know, he has been reasonably successful in making the coil perform, although he says he has not been successful in duplicating it. I was also quite curious about such machine elements as gear wheels and things like that, which the space people might use in their machinery. Again, I was shown pictures of gears which are of a type very much superior to anything which we have. Uh, things that we could make if we took the trouble to do it. The gears, incidentally, run absolutely quietly, no lubrication, and as far as I could see, no friction at all. The uh, bearings operate in the same manner as the gears themselves, so that there is no friction in the bearings. The uh, power transmitting capabilities of the gears appear to be about the same as our own uh, gears of high quality steel. The structure, needless to say, is quite a bit different. I think myself that we would have very little trouble building the gears with the materials that we have if we took the trouble to do the job and do it the way it would have to be done if the gears were going to work at all. I was also much intrigued by the information which they gave me regarding the television system which is used on some of the planets. The system reproduces in full color and with the brilliancy, which is uh, quite a bit, a range in brilliancy, that is, which is quite a bit better than our present black and white. The uh, transmission system is somewhat different than our own in that it transmits not a carrier, but a reference frequency from which the time scale at the receiving point is established. The uh, principles of color transmission are already known in uh, our own basic physics, and uh, we refer to it as the Sharonkoff radiation phenomena. The method of transmission is the, that the reference carry, uh, carrier carries a small modulation which corresponds to the sound, and on uh, one side of it there is a second carrier which uh, races back and forth in the form of a frequency modulation to give the color rendition and up and down in amplitude modulation to give the scale of brilliance. On the other side of the reference carrier, there is another carrier which uh, is frequency modulated to give the X and Y, uh, the X displacement, and amplitude modulated to give the Y displacement for the spot position on the screen. The uh, scan is random in that it does not follow a pattern of, in of lines and interlace the same as ours does. It uh, follows the uh, structure of the picture in that it spends a great deal more time on the portion of the picture where the detail is the greatest and very little time scanning the background which has very little detail in it. The, uh, the actual scan is apparently determined by a potential gradient established on the photoelectric surface of the camera tube. The system apparently is uh, capable of operation between planets or between planets and spaceships which have different time scales, which is something we certainly cannot do with our own television system. In fact, we can't even do it with the radio. I tried it. We had uh, an arrangement with uh, one of the ships to try a radio circuit. The results were most unsatisfactory. We could hear their transmitter sweeping back and forth across our receiver, and they claimed they could hear our transmitter sweeping back and forth across their receiver. In view of the fact that the uh, ships operate by manipulation of the electric, magnetic, and time fields, 
naturally anything which is located in the time field is going to be subject to the same variations as in field as the rest of the ship. And that would naturally be true of a radio transmitter, the frequency of which, being a time function, would naturally vary along with all the other things on the ship which were subjected to the changing time field. In asking about the uh, principles of operation and propulsion of the ships and their general energy sources and things like that, I find that the energy sources are a straightforward conversion of a spin of matter into the form of energy spin. And it's a straightforward uh, transformation once one understands the uh, structure of matter and the structure of energy. The uh, manipulation of the three fields, of course, is something that uh, we would find rather difficult to understand unless we do understand the true nature of the fields themselves. The ships are merely propelled by uh, a simple process of changing the three fields or the, rather the orientation of the three fields, electric, magnetic, and time fields, to produce a resultant force in the direction in which they want the ship to go or in the direction necessary to offset the gravitational pull of the Earth. This sounds rather simple, but uh, from our point of view and our extremely limited knowledge of the structure of fields, I think we would find it rather difficult to uh, build equipment to uh, either convert matter directly into energy or to provide forces to uh, propel and lift spaceships. However, the principles are comparatively simple, and I believe I understand them, at least to the point where I can see the connection between the structure and behavior of fields and the net result in the uh, production of energy and the support and propulsion of the ships. Although, naturally, uh, it's one thing to understand how a steam engine works and quite another thing to be able to build one. I am quite sure that at this stage of the game, we do not have on our Earth materials which will allow us to manipulate these fields as we would have to manipulate them in order to uh, do the job we want to do. Now, whether or not these materials exist on the Earth or whether we can make them, as a matter of fact, inquiring from some of the space people, I am informed that they do make them. They make them out of practically any kind of material that is available. It's a rather complicated process, but uh, the materials themselves are very necessary for space travel. I am informed that there are certain materials which are found on other planets and may be found on Earth down close to the core of the Earth, much below any of the, our deepest mining operations, which are naturally possible of the necessary polarization to uh, produce forces in opposition to gravity. However, one, through one contact with the space people, I am informed that this material can be made, that is, a material capable of polarization can be made from practically any of our ordinary everyday materials, which is uh, what they do. That's how they get their material, which they polarize. Our ideas, incidentally, regarding the structure of atoms uh, are quite erroneous. We visualize an atom as being a, a little hard core of some kind with a cloud of electrons in a, a rather random set of orbits flying rapidly around the, this core. As a matter of fact, atoms are not at all built that way. If one were to look for the core of an atom, I doubt very much if one would find it. All one would find would be a center of activity or a region in which, uh, which had certain geometrical properties with respect to an activity. And this region would display certain types of polarities. And as a result of these polarities, 
electrons, which again are nothing more or less than uh, regions of activity centered on the point which we call the electron. These electrons would stick on to the poles of this atom. The uh, core, if it had a fairly high atomic number, would have two inner poles. Then it would, uh, if these two poles enjoyed the companionship of two electrons, then they would develop outside of that eight more poles, which again, if they had electrons stuck onto them, and if, the, uh, if there were enough positive spin in the nucleus, then it would develop a further eight poles and so on, and in that way would develop the structure of our atoms as we find them. However, these poles aren't uh, spaced in a random manner around the atom at all. They're spaced according to a certain very definite pattern, which is due to the way the fields uh, are arranged inside the nucleus, which is, of course, is made up of a very large number of unit spins. I don't know whether this is comprehensible or not, but it is uh, in line with the information which I have obtained from the space people. I find that it is entirely consistent with the information, that is, the basic scientific observations which we have in our science. It is not, however, consistent with the interpretations which have been placed on these observations and certainly not in line with many of the uh, theories regarding the structure of nuclei and the forces which are associated with them. I have used this uh, analogy or simile before and I think that it is very appropriate. I visualize the human race somewhat as children they approach a tree, a tree of knowledge, and as they climb up the trunk of the tree, they learn. When they reach a branch, they begin to specialize in a certain aspect of science. As they crawl out on this branch, they learn more and more of this particular science. I believe that is what has happened to our race in our search for knowledge. We crawled out on the first branch we came to, and consequently, as we got farther out on the branch, we learned a great deal about the physics, the physics which we know today. This physics, unfortunately, is only one branch of the tree. We have now progressed practically to the end of the branch, and we are industriously calibering all the twigs which we find out at the end of the branch. This is a, a very emeritus project, but it isn't going to tell us nearly as much as if we went back to the trunk, climbed up another short distance, found another branch, and crawled out on it, and learned some more about basic science, which is quite different from the physics which we know today, but not inconsistent with it, since these are all branches of the same tree. I am in the process of learning something about another branch on this tree. I am quite satisfied that this branch is just as valid as the branch on which our physical science is built. Naturally, as I said before, I'm in the kindergarten, and it will probably be some time before I graduate from the kindergarten even into the first grade. But it's lots of fun in the meantime. I hope this uh, little chat will possibly bring to you my position with respect to the space people and uh, my relationship with the official Canadian project magnet. Uh, I have not passed much of this information concerning the contacts with the space people to the official government people because they definitely did not seem to be interested in receiving this information and there seemed to be a great deal of doubt in their mind whether or not the information itself was authentic. Consequently, I am proceeding entirely on my own and with the help of a few friends here who are willing to uh, study this new physics 
I believe we will be able to lay the foundation at least for something really worthwhile. Thank you.